Why do you like Sonic? Well, I assume you like Sonic, not really sure what you're doing here if you don't, but why do you like Sonic? And imagine that's quite a hard question to answer really. It is for me. I mean sure, I can go into a large multitude of things I like about the franchise, but they're just that, a multitude. For me, there are so many different components of Sonic the Hedgehog I cherish that add together to form my favourite video game franchise. It's a difficult thing to put into words, to showcase all the components that add up to make me enjoy this franchise so much. But the one game that for me perfectly tells why I hold this franchise so dearly to me is Sonic Unleashed. Through my life, I've often been asked what my favourite game of all time is, and for a long time I've shied away from answering the question, as it's a hard thing to answer. I mean, I've played a lot of games, so to pick just one is an exceptionally hard thing to do. However, in more recent times, I've realised that while I truly adore some titles, no game holds a closer place in my heart than Sonic Unleashed. The game truly represents why I love the Sonic franchise. The intense action, the huge stakes, the grand scale, the thrilling sense of speed, the vast realised world, the incredible theming, the ambition to try something new, the music, the graphics, the characters' personalities and morals, the sense of friendship and never giving up. I could go on and on about Sonic Unleashed. I know a lot of people would disagree with me, but I do think it is the best Sonic game to be released so far, and I love games like Adventure, Heroes and Generations, but for me Unleashed just always comes out on top. The game was oozing with creativity and passion, and it just felt expensive. Like you can see this game's budget is miles ahead of something like Sonic Forces. But I needn't go on, I feel Sonic Unleashed is a phenomenal game, but what do you do when you have one of the largest, most ambitious and graphically intensive Sonic games ever made that the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 were barely able to run? Port it to the fucking PlayStation 2. <laughs> Alright, alright, jokes aside, let's give this game a fair chance. So, some context. Sonic Unleashed was being developed for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2008 by Sonic Team. However, there was the other 7th gen console, the Nintendo Wii. The Wii was an extremely successful console, outselling both the PS3 and Xbox 360, and it had a larger focus on kid friendly games compared to more mature titles. This made it a perfect fit for Sonic. Now, the previous game, Sonic 06, released only on the PS3 and 360 due to the the game being too intense to be ported to the Wii. However, Sega split Sonic Team into two and tasked one half of them with creating a separate Sonic game built for the Wii from the ground up, as they didn't want to miss out on the Wii's market which they were confident Sonic would thrive in. This game came to be known as Sonic and the Secret Rings. Now say what you want about the actual game, but the sales of Secret Rings were very good and the game was a commercial success. This further cemented Sega's adamancy that Sonic had to be on the Wii. So when Sonic Unleashed was being developed, Sega commissioned a Nintendo Wii port of the game. However, this time they learned to leave Sonic Team alone and commissioned Dimps to handle the game. Dimps had already proven themselves time and time again with the Sonic IP. They created the Advance Trilogy for the Game Boy Advance, and they created Sonic Rush and Sonic Rush Adventure for the DS. All of these games were met with very positive reviews from critics and were a big success sales-wise, so Dimps seemed like an excellent choice. However, at the time of 2008, the PlayStation 2 was still very much alive and kicking. I mean, we are talking about the most successful video game console of all time here with its last game being released in 2013. Anyway, the PS2 was still a viable platform, so with the Wii's weaker hardware, a lot of developers were making scaled back versions of their next gen titles anyway, so we ended up seeing a lot of Wii games also get released on PS2. One of these games was Sonic Unleashed. Now for the record, I own and have completed every version of Sonic Unleashed there is. Yes, even the shitty Java phone version. I also have a bit of a fascination for strange ports like this. It's why I own Wolfenstein 2 on my Switch and not my 
my PS4 Pro. I find it fascinating to see how a developer scales back a game and crams it onto hardware that it's not really designed to be on. So when I heard about the PS2 version of Sonic Unleashed, you bet your fucking ass I was interested. How could they possibly take this huge grand game with incredible graphics that the PS3 and 360 could barely handle and get it onto the fucking PlayStation 2? So, when I say Sonic Unleashed, most people do think of the 360 and PS3 version. The Nintendo Wii version of the game isn't brought up quite as much, but it's by no means a forgotten game. A lot of people have a history with the Wii version of Unleashed. It sold really well on the Wii and it actually received slightly better reviews from critics than the next gen game. The Wii game is well known and I've had many a discussion with people about it. However, I have never heard anyone talk about the PlayStation 2 version of this game, save for very recently when Exo Paradigm Gamer covered it in his cross platform video on Sonic Unleashed, which is a great video by the way, highly recommend you watch it. Quick update, while making this video, Jay's Reviews made a Sonic Unleashed video and he brought up the PS2 version as well, so yeah, there's that. But seriously, am I just talking to the wrong people or something? I never ever hear people bring up the PS2 version of Sonic Unleashed, and half the people I talk to didn't even know a PS2 version of the game exists. It seems to me to just be a forgotten port. I don't know where the fascination comes from with this game for me, it's just so strange, an extremely scaled back version of the Wii game for PS2, like, were people really asking for this? Like, really? Regardless, it's absolutely crazy to me that a 3D Sonic boost game and my favourite boost game is officially on the PlayStation 2, so let's dive into it and see just how well they translated Sonic Unleashed over to the platform. So the story for this version of Unleashed is basically identical to the story in the 7th gen version. The game opens with the same amazing CGI intro of Sonic fighting Eggman on one of his battleships in space. However here the intro is compressed to hell and looks like a video file you download off the internet in 2004. The intro is also now letterboxed since the PS2 version of Unleashed doesn't support widescreen. Why? This isn't an early PS2 game, it's 2008. The 7th gen consoles were well on the way and had normalised widescreen. Most if not all PS2 games being released around this time supported widescreen. And on top of that, the Wii version is in widescreen as well. It just comes off as lazy. But anyway, this is supposed to be the story section. As said before, the game's story is basically exactly the same as the 7th gen game. In fact, the game doesn't even bother rendering its own cutscenes, instead choosing to just compress the 360 game's cutscenes. It again looks like dog shit. The original cutscenes are so colourful and crisp, but here, again, we're getting that 2004 web video quality. The Wii version did the exact same thing, and while it's still not great, it was definitely serviceable. In the PS2 version, it's ridiculously compressed. However, while the actual way the cutscenes are brought over is shocking, these cutscenes are still great. Sonic Unleashed had an exceptional story, and for the most part it still does in this version of the game. We still get Jason Griffith's great performance of Sonic, we still get the great dynamic between Chip and Sonic, we still get the scenes where Amy doesn't recognise Sonic, where Sonic helps Amy, where Chip feels scared for what's to come, where Chip explains to Sonic who he really is, and this superb all around performance of Mike Pollock, finding that perfect blend between comical and dark for Eggman. Lovely stuff. This time around, we do miss out on a couple of bits of dialogue, like any to do with the tornado flying stages, as they're completely absent from the game, but pretty much everything is here. The main story is fully intact, and while still great, it just doesn't have the magic that the story on the PS3 and 360 version of the game had. Now, you're probably asking, how can this be true, Lemon? You yourself just stated that the story is the exact same as the 7th gen version, literally just reusing the game's cutscenes. And, um, well, that is true, but this game just doesn't have the world building that the 7th gen version does. Let me explain. So in the Sonic Team version of Sonic Unleashed, there was a fully 3D hub world for each country, somewhere Sonic could explore and walk through. Those areas were always littered with the locals who you could talk to and get information from, some relevant and some not. But all of this made the world of Sonic Unleashed feel so alive and lived in. To walk through the back streets of Apatos, seeing people strolling through the area and telling us things like their opinion on the world splitting apart, it all just felt so alive and real. These people gave a sense of perspective to the plot, we can see how all the different cultures live and how they are reacting to the dark guy catastrophe. I loved speaking to a local for the first time, getting to know them, then speaking to them later on when I changed to the Werehog and seeing how they'd react to my drastic change. I loved asking around for info on where the Gaia Temple was, finding someone who knew and then directing me down a street or path and me physically listening and heading that way. It felt real and made the various areas like Apatos, Spagonia, Alaska and the rest not just feel like level themes but like actual real places with real inhabitants. 
accountants, with real issues, real personalities, their own enjoyments and their own problems. But in the PS2 game all of this is lost. Instead of these bubbling cosy hub worlds, we instead get this static screen with different areas to click on. We then talk to these cardboard cutouts of inhabitants. It's just not the same at all. Instead of exploring the back streets of Spagonia to find someone who knows where the professor is while on the way taking in the environment and meeting all the different locals, I'm randomly pressing different points on a zoomed out still of Spagonia to be treated to a crappy Microsoft PowerPoint presentation interaction with someone until I eventually press the right icon and the character opens up the right way for me. And because of this, I feel the story just loses a bit of its magic. Like yeah, the core stuff's all there, but it's the little stuff that just adds up and everything feels a lot more static and lifeless. The theming of Sonic Unleashed is some of the best in the entire Sonic franchise in my opinion. Every country you visit in Unleashed feels so unique and stands out on its own, so it's just such a shame to see these iconic places converted to a static fucking PowerPoint presentation. One thing the game actually does have over the 7th gen version though, is that you do actually get to go into the Gaia Temple for each country and enter the levels from there. That's a pretty nice new addition. In the 7th gen version we only ever actually saw the interior of these Gaia Temples in cutscenes, but here we can actually see them in game. The architecture is also different for each continent so that's a bonus. But for me, it's undeniable that a level of charm and depth was lost with the absence of the fully 3D hub world. Stuff just doesn't have the same oomph it did. For example, in Spagonia we're shown the cutscene of the residents possessed by Dog Gaia harassing Amy. Now in the 7th gen version, a brawl then ensues of Sonic fighting the Dog Gaia creatures that were possessing the crowd. This short section also serves a purpose of showcasing to us how Chip can identify possessed people through taking photos of them in the hub world. But in the PS2 version, we just get this crappy PowerPoint quick time event and that's it. I never had to do it again throughout the rest of the game. The whole point of the section introducing the camera mechanic is lost as well, as that's also completely absent in this game. It's clear this section was just added in quickly so that they could include the cutscene of Sonic rescuing Amy, as it's a great cutscene and shows Sonic's embarrassment as a werehog along with his care for Amy. But I mean, like why not just cut out the gameplay and stick the before and after cutscenes together? This is just pointless. Another example would be Missouri. On PS3 when coming to Missouri, I saved the village from Dr Eggman, fought him in the Egg Beetle, headed to the village, got to know all the locals and the culture by asking for where the Gaia Temple is, raced through Savannah Citadel day and fought through Savannah Citadel night and then finally headed into the Gaia Temple and restored the continent. But in the PS2 and Wii version, Missouri is basically reduced to nothing more than a pit stop. The night and day acts are completely removed. All we get in Missouri is that one fight with the Egg Beetle and that crappy PowerPoint hub world. So we basically land in Missouri, click around on the static Missouri hub, fight the Egg Beetle, then just get a cutscene of Sonic and Chip restoring the Chaos Emerald to the Gaia Temple. It just feels a lot more lazy than the 7th gen version and has less impact. Like, we don't really have time to even get adjusted to Missouri before we're off again. Do you see what I mean when I say a bit of the magic is just lost? The crappy compression of the cutscenes, along with the lack of hub worlds and a feeling of depth in the world, dragged the story down to where I would say it's definitely worse than the 7th gen story, despite being the exact same plot and cutscenes. With that said though, the story of Sonic Unleashed is still exceptional, and in my opinion the best 3D Sonic plot there is, regardless of what platform you play it on. So all these things I've mentioned do take away from the story a bit, but they are minor, and the PS2 version still gives you the great writing and immersive plot of the 7th gen game. You might be watching it through shitty compressed FMV, but it's here nonetheless. Ah, okay. Now this is the interesting part, the gameplay. Dimps had a lot of stuff to translate over here. While they technically started the boost formula with the Rush games, Sonic Team had translated it to 3D, and it was far more complex. Sonic Unleashed boasted speeds no other Sonic game had ever came close to up to that point, with huge detail levels to run through. And then there was also the other half of the game with the Werehog, which featured a complex fighting system with a lot of combos, platforming, large levels and an emphasis on a lot of enemies being present on screen at once. There was also a whole intricate upgrade system where you upgrade different aspects of the Werehog from XP gained in the stages. On top of all this, there was also the Sun and Moon medals to collect in each stage, which were required to get access to the later levels. So how did Dimps transfer all this to the PS2? Well, let's start with the day stages. So the controls of Sonic in the day stages are very similar to how he controls on the 7th gen version. All of Sonic's moveset from the Sonic Team Unleashed have been successfully translated over. We have the air dash, the air boost, the stomp, the slide, the wall jump, the boost, the drift, 
and the light speed dash. However, one thing that I did have to do was change my muscle memory around a bit. When playing the 7th gen version of Unleashed, I usually gravitate towards the PS3 version with the DualShock 3. So when going to play Unleashed on PS2 with the DualShock 2, which features essentially the exact same layout as the PS3 controller, you'd maybe think the controllers would be the same, but in fact, they are not at all. So the home attack has been returned to its rightful place, being mapped to the X button, which I have no complaints at all with. The quick step buttons stay the same as well, L1 and R1, however everything else is changed around. To boost you now press the circle button and to slide you press the square button, but to drift you press the square button while having the left analog stick pushed either left or right respectively, and to stomp you hit square in the air. The light speed dash is no longer mapped to the triangle button as well, it's now circle, the same as the boost. Now some of these changes are a bit strange, like the light speed dash being the same as the boost and the drift not being L2 and R2, but honestly I adjusted pretty quickly, and while different the controls are not necessarily bad. Sonic's movement feels a lot more sluggish and heavy now. Base Sonic moving around is honestly quite tedious, and this is clear for any sections in the Guy Temple where you literally just walk around with Sonic. He takes way longer to build up speed and start running compared to the 7th gen version, and turning feels much more slow and less tight. In the PS3 Unleashed, Sonic kind of still controlled like this. Once he started moving in one direction, you couldn't really just have him turn around on a dime. But before he had entered his running stage, 7th gen Unleashed Sonic still felt quite tight to control and was relatively snappy. He could be used relatively okay for tight-ish platforming. Don't get me wrong, it's nothing compared to the level of snappiness in any of the adventure games, but it got the job done. But in PS2 Unleashed, base Sonic to move is just horrible really. He's so slow and heavy feeling, it's really hard to explain without actually playing it for yourself. There almost feels like a lag between pushing the stick and Sonic moving or turning. Luckily the day stages basically never have you slow down for more focused platforming, so this issue never really shows its head too much. Once Sonic actually starts running, his controls are actually great. Sonic's turning feels great, his jump feels snappy and all of his skills work well. However, the strange thing is, despite this game essentially being the exact same game as the Wii version, Sonic feels notably worse to control on PS2. This is something Exo Paradigm Gamer brought up in his review, and I completely agree. It's clear that the Dimps version of Sonic Unleashed was made with the segmented angular analog stick of the Nunchuck or Classic controller. When it came time to bring the game over to PS2, it's clear they couldn't be asked to recalibrate the controls to be optimised for the DualShock 2's full circle analog stick. The result of this is that turning Sonic can sometimes just feel a bit off. Sonic almost snaps through different angles when turning. Now when playing this on the Wii with the Classic Controller Pro, this feels great. Sonic Colors did a similar thing and honestly it works really well. It makes things feel really tight, but on the PS2 the DualShock 2 isn't designed for this, so it can just feel strange. This is a minor thing, but it just feels lazy and unnecessary. The boost for Sonic works much differently now as well. In the 7th gen version of Sonic Unleashed, the boost is essentially something you will always be using. Pretty much the whole time you're running on the ground, you can expect to be holding down the boost button, but in the PS2 version the boost is nowhere near as emphasised. In in fact, it's quite rarely used. For starters, there's no more holding down the boost button. The boost bar is now actually segmented into sections. By hitting the boost button, you use one of the sections and boost for a few seconds. To continually boost, you would have to keep pressing the boost button again and again. However, you will rarely be doing this as this game is designed much differently from the 7th gen version. The boost in this game can essentially only really be used if you're going in a straight line. The boost essentially makes Sonic uncontrollable. Sonic is rocketed forward and turning is essentially impossible. Possible, with only very small adjustments to the direction being able to be made, and the only thing that can really cancel you out of it is a jump. Because of this fact, the boost is something you use much less in the PS2 version. I only really found myself boosting when it was clear there was a straight path ahead. And fair play to the game, despite clearly being scaled back and less emphasised, the boost is still very exhilarating to use, and the fact that you use it much less than in the 7th gen game makes it feel more exciting and thrilling when you actually do use it. Just like its PS3 counterpart, the speed you can get to in this game is incredibly fast, and miles ahead of anything you were doing in any of the games before it. So the the controls for the day stages, in conclusion, are kind of mixed for me. The drift feels excellent. The home and attack is now mapped back to the jump button, which is great. The quick step works just like it does in the 360 version. Pretty much all of Sonic's skills have been carried over from the 7th gen versions, and the boost has been changed to adapt to the weaker hardware, while still retaining the thrilling sense of speed you got when boosting in the 7th gen versions. However, 
base movement feels incredibly sluggish. Like, the 360 version of Unleashed got some flack for having more sluggish and unresponsive base movement for Sonic when placed next to the adventure games, but this really is unresponsive. Sonic feels so heavy to start moving. The boost can be a tad too uncontrollable for my liking sometimes. Some of Sonic's skills feel sluggish to execute as well, for example sliding now feels like there's a bit of a delay between pressing square and actually sliding, which can be a bit disorientating. Wall jumping as well feels a bit strange, I'm not really sure why, but wall jumping in this game feels a bit finicky for me. The same happens on the Wii version as well, I just sometimes don't jump off the wall and fall. I can't really pinpoint why as well, as much as I try. And the last thing is that the controls have been flipped around in some cases when compared to the PS3 version, like the boost being circle, drift and slide being square, and the light speed dash also being the boost button as well. Although, while it takes me a few minutes to adapt to the new revised controls, once you adjust, they actually work pretty well, and I don't really have any real major complaints for them. However, my main issue really is that the devs couldn't be asked to properly recalibrate Sonic's movement and steering for the DualShock 2 analog stick, which can make things feel really, really weird sometimes. However, on a whole, I will still say that the controls are decent, and I never really felt like I was fighting with them. Hey, I'll give the game this, the drift works way better than the 7th gen Unleashed Drift. Okay now let's discuss level design. This is probably, in my opinion, the strongest aspect of this version of the game. So it was clear from the offset when working with the hardware of the Wii and PS2, copying closely the day stages from the 7th gen versions was not happening. Those levels were lush, dense and huge. And it's clear Dimps knew this when making the game as well. So instead of trying to mimic the original game stages and remake them as closely as they could, they essentially chose to use the theming of each stage and then basically do their own thing with the level design. And this changed level design mixed with a different boost system and controls makes for a very different idea on how a Sonic boost game should be. Out of all the boost games we have gotten, the 7th Gen Unleashed, Colors, Generations and Forces, the PS2 and Wii version of Unleashed Boost feels the most out there and different. Level design in this game feels a lot less cluttered and a fair bit more streamlined. There are long stretches of straight corridors with small diversions of the main path wide areas to emphasise the drift, and on a whole the spectacle has really been downplayed in this port. In the 7th gen version of Unleashed, the spectacle was a big part of the game, whether that be blasting through the tables and chairs in Windmill Isle, flinging them everywhere and smashing them into oblivion, grinding down past that huge waterfall in Jungle Joyride, wall running up buildings in Skyscraper Scamper, or grinding down the clock tower in Rooftop Run. Now some of these moments are so iconic to Sonic Unleashed that Dimps kept them in and translated them into the PS2 version be in a scaled back fashion. For example, the clock tower in Rooftop Run no longer looks like this, it looks like this. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Yeah, a lot is lost compared to the 7th gen version, but I mean, it's the fucking PS2. Some of the things they translate I actually think beat the original 360 version as well. My main example of this being the bobsleigh sections in Cool Edge. In the PS3 version it was decent, it provided a nice break up from the typical boost gameplay but it felt very scripted and very claustrophobic, as you were never given much space to move at all, essentially being limited to a glorified slide at all times. But in the PS2 version Sonic gets these huge open stretches of snow to slide down, and on top of that his controls are actually improved. Not only does his jump in the bobsleigh they feel much better in this version, being higher and snappier, but they've also added a lot more moves for Sonic to do while riding the bobsleigh. In the 360 version, you could steer and jump, that's it, but in the PS2 version, you can also drift and boost. The drift, just like the on foot drift, works great, being able to tightly turn around corners, and the boost also works great with these huge open stretches of land. Cool Edge in this version, I actually really like. The PS3 version is great as well, but it only focuses on the outside environment, save for a few brief moments when you go into caves. And in the PS2 version, something goes deep into the caves and goes into these ice themed temple areas, and it's really interesting, and a great example example of Dimps taking the already strong source material but adding their own thing to it. These levels have a very different feel to them when compared against the PS3 version. The quick step is not used anywhere near as much in this game now that I think about it as well. 
The main levels that use it are Dragon Road and Rooftop Run briefly, but aside from that, not many areas ring out to me. Another thing that has been dramatically scaled back is the auto run sections when fighting either the big robot behind you or the laser robot in front of you. So in the 7th gen version, the laser enemies would show up in rows of 3 and have you weave in and out of them and dodge as they try and shoot you with lasers. As the game progresses, these sections got harder until by the end of the game, the laser robots are shooting very fast and on top of that, there's obstacles to dodge like bombs on the ground and standard enemies. What you do to attack is boost it into the standard enemies which knocks them into the laser enemies in a very cool sequence. In the PS2 version, these sections have been scaled back dramatically. So for starters, you can no longer boost into other enemies to knock out the laser type robots. You essentially just have to keep dodging until the game decides that this section is over. There's also no obstacles on the track to dodge at all. There's just some rings. The main thing is that there's no longer three robots for all three lanes of the quick step. Instead, it's now just one robot who switches lanes. It's hard to tell which lane he's moving to when the path moves direction and on a whole these sections are nowhere near as fun as the 7th gen versions. Another thing that's basically been butchered is the sections where you're chased by the big robot. In the 7th gen version, the robot would attack two of the three lanes you're running on, making you quickly dodge to avoid damage. On top of this, as the game progressed and got harder, obstacles like bombs would be in your way constantly, so you'd have to dodge two things at once. By the time you get to Jungle Joyride, these sections are fucking tense and have you constantly spamming the quick step and jump buttons, but in the PS2 version it's much different. This N64 looking motherfucker shows up and slowly trails you. He will try and hit you in two of the three lanes very slowly until you reach a ramp. At this point you will get behind him and repeatedly boost at him, hitting him, until another ramp switches you back to being in front of him. Repeat two to three times and that's it. It's fucking boring and there's no sense of thrill there. These long stretches of straightforward road as well are one of the few instances where the segmented boost really looks a bit crap. However, with all this said, the laser sections and big robot sections are nowhere near as present in this version of the game, only really being used a few notable times, so this issue never really poked its head too much. On a whole, I really do dig the level design of this version of the game. When it came to making the boost mechanics and controls, they undoubtedly had to be scaled back, as did most of the game, but Dimps made levels that work perfectly with the control scheme and mechanics they created for Sonic. The levels complement him so well. If you took PS2 Unleashed Sonic and put him in a PS3 Unleashed stage, it would feel horrible, but here the stages and mechanics mesh so well together. They complement the controls, they're fun, they're fast paced, and they keep the great theming from the 7th gen version, albeit with a much more scaled back level of spectacle. What really makes the day stages in this game as well is you can now exclusively focus on the thrill of the stage, as medal collecting in this game is completely absent. This is by far one of the strongest aspects of this port. Instead of finding Sun and Moon medals hidden throughout stages, and then using the medals you've collected to unlock new stages, Sonic is just gifted medals as a reward for finishing the stages. This helps the pacing of the game hugely. In the 7th gen version, I didn't really mind metal collecting, since exploring the hub world and every corner of the lush levels was fun in its own right due to the game's great atmosphere and graphics, but the PS2 version obviously doesn't have either of those things, with the PowerPoint hub worlds and the horrendous graphics. Trust me, we will get to that. So the game is more streamlined and simple in terms of pacing. It really helps the game and makes the levels just be enjoyed for what they are. Another great example of Dimps diverging away from the source material and doing their own thing a bit. To be honest, while I don't mind the metal collecting in the 7th gen version of Unleashed, I can't acknowledge that the game would be better without them, and they can just be tedious to collect at times. So if the PS3 version just gave us the medals for finishing stages like the PS2 version, I think the game would have benefited greatly. In conclusion, the day stages while in my opinion still inferior to the day stages of the PS3 version are still excellent in their own right and they provide some great high speed action. Okay, so overall, I think Dims did a very good job of remaking the day stages for lesser hardware while doing their own thing. Can the same be said for the Werehog though? Well, this one's a bit more complex. So I am aware at how divided the fandom is on the Werehog gameplay as is, but where I stand personally is I think it's a fun gameplay style. I don't think it's as good as the day stages, but in its own right, I think it's a good gameplay style. The combat's satisfying, levels are big, almost too big sometimes, theming is great, the platforming is great, and the controls feel great. The main the main reason I'm so fond of the Werehog though is its depth. There is clear depth to the combat here. It's way more intricate than anyone would expect. There are tons of different combos to learn and loads of things to upgrade like health, strength, combat, shield. The combat had a great learning curve and a lot of intricacy that made it very satisfying. However, the Werehog in this version of the game has been simplified by a fair amount, and it does affect my enjoyment of the gameplay style. So for starters, the Werehog's controls have seemingly been changed around for no real reason. Now most of the stuff is the same. 
two attack buttons are still square and triangle. However, in the PS3 version, triangle was a punch attack and square was a scratch attack. In the PS2 version, both buttons seem to just be different types of scratch attacks, which is a bit disappointing as it means there's not really much difference between the two attacks. Jump is still the same as well. The main differences are in the climbing and the sprints. So climbing in this game is mapped to R1, which in itself is fine. There's no issue with it being R1, it's a good button to map it to. The main issue is the delay. Between pressing the R1 button and Sonic actually grabbing onto the pole or whatever, there feels like there's a two second delay. It is really apparent and it has caused issues for me, as just like in the 7th gen version, some of the werehog sections with the climbing are incredibly precise with the timing. This was already a minor issue with the PS3 version, but here, with what feels like a two second delay, the problem is way more apparent. In fact, for most of the sections like swinging from multiple poles, I actually opted to just keep my finger pressed down on R1 at all times, as I found it was much more effective in Sonic locking onto the actual poles. On a whole, the climbing for this game feels much more restrictive and extremely stiff compared to the 7th gen version. Love them or hate them in the 7th gen version, they still felt pretty natural and snappy. In this version, they feel incredibly stiff and nowhere near as fun. My biggest problem with the controls of the Werehog in the PS2 version though, is something that proved a hindrance and incredibly annoying throughout my playthrough of the game. So instead of Sprint being mapped to an actual button like R2, which it was in the PS3 version, in this version of Unleashed to Sprint, you double tap the left analog stick. Really thought they would have mapped Sprint to the L3 button if they want to keep Sprint completely linked to the analog stick, but no. To Sprint, you double tap the left analog stick and Sonic will start sprinting, only stopping when you stop moving the stick in a direction. Now initially, this wasn't too bad. Double tapping the analog stick wasn't a particularly hard command to execute, and the sprint itself felt quite good, honestly feeling faster than the PS3 sprint by a fair amount. However, as the game progresses and the Werehog stages begin to throw level design in with a lot of pits and precise platforming, a big issue began to arise. I died time and time again from moving the analog stick slightly to make slight movements on platforms, the game then registers that as me wanting to sprint and rockets me forward to run off the cliff. It happened consistently throughout and it limited the enjoyment I could have as it felt like I was constantly tiptoeing around the control scheme out of fear of being thrown off a cliff. Another thing that's taken a hit is the combat. It's just been simplified a lot. You no longer have shields you can use and instead just have a standard block that always works and a roll move. I will say the roll move is wired and actually quite good. It's an effective way to dodge attacks quickly. The main hit for the combat is the amount of combos you can pull off has been scaled back significantly and overall the moves you can perform as the Werehog are far less varied compared to the PS3 version. One thing they completely changed from the 7th gen version is the level up system. In the PS3 game, after finishing a stage, you would use the XP you earned to level up different aspects of the Werehog. There are quite a lot of different aspects you could level up, and they all could be leveled up significantly, so it created this great choice for the player on what to level up. How do you play the Werehog, and what attributes will benefit you the most? In the PS2 version, all of that choice is removed. At the end of each level, the XP you've earned will fill up an overall Werehog level, and when you reach certain amounts, you unlock things like new combos to pull off. So, it's not awful, it's still pretty decent, as they still have the Werehog able to be leveled up and built upon. It's just a big step down from the 7th gen version since it's been simplified and there's no real choice or thought behind leveling up the Werehog as it's all done automatically. The actual encounters with the enemies in the Werehog stages are still decently fun though in my opinion. There still is a satisfying gameplay loop involved with just obliterating all the different dark guy spawns. A certain level of the spectacle is lost as the animations for attacking are much more basic, a lot of the particle effects are missing, the enemies character models are scaled back and like the atmospheric glow the 360 models had, the QTE finish moves are gone and most importantly, the amount of enemies on screen at once is noticeably less than the 7th gen version. But with that said, the PS2 version still gets an admirable amount of enemies on screen at once in certain places. While the combat is clearly scaled back, it still manages to stay relatively faithful to the combat in the PS3 version. It still has a fun, satisfying gameplay loop to it in my opinion, but it definitely is a step down compared to the PS3 version. The level design of the PS2 Werehog is actually the best aspect about him in this version of the game if you ask me. In the PS3 version, the Werehog levels could outstay the welcome at times. Let's be real, they could take very long to complete, especially when you have to search every aspect of the fucking level for sun and moon medals. In the PS2 version, the level design is actually really good for the Werehog. It's kinda following in the footsteps of the PS2 day stages level design, still keeping the core things from the 7th gen version, but adding a bit of a different spin and layout to things. The levels provide a good balance of fun and interest in platform challenges, combat encounters, and great use of the 7th gen level themes. The only real issue with the platforming is the aforementioned double tap of the analog stick to sprint, which is a headache I won't lie, and does drag down the enjoyment of the platforming sections as a whole. The main thing I think that really helped the Werehog stages in the PS2 version is the removal of the metal collecting, meaning you can focus on the action of a stage and just making it to the goal, and the fact that the stages length have been reduced 
would you significantly improve things a lot as well. What would once be a single stage in the 7th gen version would be something like 3 stages in the PS2 version, as the levels are broken up much more. So overall the Werehog I feel doesn't flop in this game, I still think it's a pretty solid experience. There are clear flaws there and the 7th gen Werehog is by far the superior one in my opinion, but I do feel this version of the Werehog is a relatively faithful transition of the gameplay style to much lesser hardware. Granted there is a few strange oddities with the PS2 version, like the double tap to sprints, but I still think it's a solid experience and not a bore to go through. Overall yes, I do think the day stages are by far the better part of the game, and I do think that the PS2 translation of the day stages is better than the PS2 translation of the night stages, but the Werehog is by no means bad in this game and is still very fun to play through, especially with the lack of metal hunting and shorter stages in general. I will also say this version of the Werehog feels a fair bit easier, I won't go as far to say it's easy but it's definitely not as tense as the 7th gen version, which could also be a plus for many, as some did complain the Werehog was just too hard at times. One last thing I do want to touch on for the gameplay section here is the pacing for this game can be a bit off at times. So I will admit that the 7th gen version does have this same problem, but for me, with the lack of atmosphere and depth from the PowerPoint hub world replacements, this issue is highlighted further. Pickle. This guy is the most impractical motherfucker on the planet. He'll pull shit like having you fly over to his lab in Spagonia where a Gaia temple lies just to tell you to head to fucking Chunnan to chat to locals. There are times in this game where you'll be sent to a country where a Gaia temple literally is, do some minuscule task like talk to the locals or maybe have a one-off fight with Eggman, then go back to Spagonia to talk to Pickle, only for him to tell you to fucking go back to the country you were just in as there's a Gaia temple there. You've wasted so much of my time. Now granted, as I said before, this isn't something that is a specific issue to the PS2 port, as all versions of Unleashed do suffer from this. But the fact that the world feels so much more static and the hub worlds are so much more lifeless and boring to explore just makes this issue stick out that much more. The game is also just missing Empire City and Missouri, which isn't great. Another little pet peeve I have is the fact that for some reason you can't skip cutscenes in this version of the game, which is strange as you can in the 7th gen version. Yeah, this is a little thing, but it does make repeat playthroughs annoying. However, while on the topic of pacing, there is one thing I have to give to the PS2 port. The lack of any medal collecting at all is a welcome change in my book. Having them just awarded to you for finishing levels streamlines things a lot and helps keep things going. Ah, uh, okay. It's time to talk about the graphics for this game and... Oh boy, there. Well, well, there's something else. So Sonic Unleashed, the main 7th gen version, is for me by far the most gorgeous Sonic game we have. The lush environments, movie-like character models, and the supreme lighting. It all made the game feel very, very premium in my opinion. For 2008, Sonic Unleashed was very impressive graphically, and obviously for the Wii and PS2 port, things had to be toned down considerably. Now the Wii version of this game actually looks pretty decent, obviously nowhere near the level of the PS3 game, but in some areas it can look really nice. But this PlayStation 2 port, sweet mother of god. This game looks fucking hideous, even for the PS2. The level's geometry feels blocky and static. The texture quality is absolutely hideous. The lighting is literally missing. The colours look washed out and dull. And my god, look at these fucking character models. Seriously, what the fuck is this? This is like something out of a fucking N64 game. And now I'm not taking the excuse of, it's on the PS2, what do you expect? This game is hideous, and the PlayStation 2 can do so much better. Look at games like Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, hell look at other Sonic games, Sonic Heroes, Sonic Riders and Shadow the Hedgehog all look far more appealing than this game. Hell the Dreamcast Sonic games look better than this. Running through Emerald Coast or sliding down City Escape is much more visually appealing than this shit. In fact when playing this game there are times that I feel like I'm looking at like a fan project of what a boost game would look like on Sega Dreamcast or something. I think the biggest shame for me is just the lack of colour. Things look really washed out in this port, which is a shame, because Sonic Unleashed is such a vibrant and colourful game. This port just feels lazy to be honest, I mean take away the fact that the game looks like dog shit, it doesn't even support progressive scan, which I would have thought a PS2 game from 2008 would have had being honest. But forget that, the game doesn't even support widescreen, again. This is 2008, this ain't no launch title from 2000, and the Wii version supports widescreen, so why no widescreen here? Another thing that's taken a hit is the sound effects. The music seems relatively unscathed, but some of these sound effects just sound like they're coming through a Sega Mega Drive or something. They are not pleasant to the ears. 
just makes the game feel very cheap. Overall, the graphical fidelity of this game is borderline pathetic in this port. This is genuinely one of the most ugly PS2 games I've ever seen. Things just feel static and lifeless. Even little things like how in the Wii 360 and PS3 version, as Sonic runs, his spines push back behind him to emphasise his speed and the wind pushing against him. But here in the PS2 version, they stay still and wide and it just doesn't look as good. The picture this game outputs is atrocious. There is dithering everywhere. It makes the game almost have a checkerboard look to it. And it's not pleasant at all. It's not even like the game is consistent with the frame rate either. I mean, come on. The game targets 30, but things can get choppy frequently. The frame rate never gets atrocious, but at times it's noticeable. And for the way the game looks, it's just ridiculous. This should not be happening. The graphics here are, for me, where this port really lets itself down. It's just so fucking ugly, there's no way around it. There's nothing here I can say looks good. I mean, I'm sorry, but it looks like an old iPhone 4 game or something. Jesus Christ. Now let's tackle the ending for this game. So for me, this is an important thing for this port to get right. The 7th gen version of Unleashed Ending felt so grand and important. The sense of spectacle was off the charts, and personally, I think it was a perfect conclusion to Sonic Unleashed. It created a huge sense of atmosphere and tension. So let's start with the Egg Dragoon. There isn't much to say here, as this is basically just a warm-up to the big fight with Dark Gaia, but the fight is being translated over from the 7th gen consoles very efficiently here, in my opinion. Pretty much everything is the same, or at least very similar. We still get the thrill of falling down to the core of the earth. The only thing we miss out on, which again is minor but just something that contributes to the atmosphere and overall vibe of Sonic Unleashed, is as you slowly wither away at Eggman's health, we can see some really aggressive dark dialogue from Eggman. It's clear just how desperate Eggman is to kill Sonic. He truly wants him gone and as we see the probability that he will lose climb higher and higher, we can see Eggman's frustration and panic. It honestly is a hugely forgotten Amazing Mike Pollock moment. The guy really portrays that anger and desperation. Even Sonic says, Jeez, Eggman! Simmer down! This in general is an excruciatingly overlooked scene in the Sonic franchise. Anyway, it's not a huge deal, but in the PS2 port, all of this dialogue is completely missing. It just seems like such a shame to waste that amazing dialogue, but hey, we move. Now in terms of atmosphere for the actual fight, I will say this version comes pretty close to matching the 7th gen version, mainly for the fact that it uses the 7th gen cutscenes and the CGI cutscenes so we can see all this incredible tension in crisp, compressed PS2 full motion video. The fight as the Guy Colossus is actually much easier than the 7th gen version, and overall I'd actually maybe say it's better, if not on par. Controls are snappy, the Dark Guy attacks are easier to plan for, and overall it feels a lot easier and a lot less frustrating. Now for the sections where we control Sonic running through the Gaia Colossus, these again I feel are a pretty good translation all things considered. The level design is a bit different but that's to accommodate for the different style of boost gameplay which you should be more than adjusted to by now if you've made it this far in the game. I will say a level of the spectacle and wow factor is lost because the graphics are just a bit naff but it's a minor thing. These sections still feel exhilarating. I will say though, the disconnect between the 360 Sonic model and the cutscenes and then this blocky motherfucker is very apparent in these sections. Now for the final section with Perfect Dark Gaia. So I'll say, since this game basically just uses all the cutscenes from the 7th gen game, we still get the atmospheric as hell CGI cutscene of Perfect Dark Gaia transforming and literally ripping the Werehog out of Sonic. So even this PS2 version has got me on the hook here. I'm invested. And you know what? The fight is great. It's much different to the PS3 fight, and while I think the PS3 fight is a bit more atmospheric and has better theming, this fight in terms of raw gameplay, I actually think is more fun. As Supersonic, you collect rings to stay alive and dodge perfect Dark Guy's attacks until you have a chance to blast at one of his eyes. Rinse and repeat. On a whole, it's pretty fun, if a bit simple. I guess with the 7th gen version, due to the fight being so long and hard, it feels that much more rewarding when you do win, and Dark Guy as a whole just feels a bit more threatening, but again, these are minor nitpicks. Good job game, nice translation. And then obviously there is the ending of Sonic Unleashed, which is exactly the same in this version of the game, as like I've said before, it uses the 7 gen cutscenes. We see Sonic collapse after defeating Dark Gaia, Chip rescue him and throw him to the surface, sealing him in the Earth's core with Dark Gaia, sacrificing himself to save Sonic. Sonic wakes up in Apatos, sees Chip's bracelet, puts it on and runs off into the distance with Tails next to him in the tornado as endless possibilities plays. Damn, even in this version you just can't beat that fucking ending. I've got goosebumps mate. Yeah, I'm shaking. In conclusion, 
why do you never hear the PS2 version of Sonic Unleashed ever talked about, and should you go and play this version? Well after completing the game through and through and spending months making this video, I feel like I can safely answer both of those questions. I believe Sonic Unleashed PS2 port is forgotten about because it has no real purpose anymore. The game was a quick port job of the Wii version for people lagging behind with the outdated PlayStation 2 in 2008. It was made to capitalise profits, not to bring Sonic Unleashed to a different audience. Sega basically just wanted the Wii version on PS2 to get more sales, they weren't really concerned with how the game turned out, as long as it got on there more or less. The reason it's forgotten is because the PS2 is now a 21 year old console, there's just no reason to go to this version anymore. It was made for people who at the time had last generation's hardware and had yet to upgrade, but now the PS2 is long out of the spotlight. The port just has no need to exist anymore really. But at its core, this version of Sonic Unleashed, while different and still inferior to the 7th gen version, is still a good game in my opinion. And is worth a playthrough. It is a different experience. Now all the core stuff is here except for a few setbacks, but what really weighs this game down is the technical side. This game is fuck ugly, runs like piss, has Sonic 06 long loading times and can just feel unresponsive and clunky. So to answer the question should you play the PS2 port of Sonic Unleashed, I have to say no. But what you should do is play the Nintendo Wii version of Sonic Unleashed. That version is essentially the PS2 version, but much better technically. More responsive controls, faster loading times, actual lighting, far superior graphics, widescreen, and a variety of different controller support options, including Nintendo GameCube. I really don't think you should sleep on the Wii version of Unleashed, as it really is its own game and deserves a chance, but avoid this PS2 version at all costs. The Wii version is by far the best one to go for. I do find it very interesting to see games on lesser hardware they weren't made in mind for, but the technical side of this game is just atrocious. Take my advice and get the Wii version. So with that, I find it hard to say this port is a bad game, because it's not. I mean, I'm literally recommending you essentially play the game just on more powerful hardware to get better technical performance. So I can't say this is a bad game. What it is, is a bad port of a good game. Nevertheless, it's an interesting piece of history in the Hedgehog's career, and I found going through it and making this video a very fun experience. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching, and thank you for all the support. I know I made a separate video for it, but I do just want to thank you all again for 1000 subscribers. I know my videos take a while and my upload schedule isn't always great, but I will try to get stuff out to you as soon as I can. If you have enjoyed this video, hitting subscribe would really help me out, and it will make sure you're notified when my next upload is. If you guys also want to see more from me and some of my my friends, be sure to check out my second channel, Lemonade, for more casual content. If you also want a place to hang out and talk about all things Sonic the Hedgehog and gaming, make sure to join our official Lemon Discord server. And lastly, follow me on Twitter if you want to see me, I don't know, tweet. Thank you all for watching, and I'll hopefully see you again in not too long.